So let's discuss how common government policies directly increase your cost of living and they make life worse for most people. Now let's face it, life can actually be challenging enough just with the ups and downs that living in kind of an unpredictable world can produce. Accidents, tragedies, choices, bad relationships, and sometimes just bad luck, these can all ch cause kind of setbacks and challenges uh, in life basically for all of us. Now, some of these events can be avoided, of course. Some of them just have to be muddled through, and then some end up changing your life in directions that you never plan to go. Now, I'll give some specific examples from my home state of Washington, but it doesn't matter where you live. These examples of harmful and costly government policies, they're common and they're easy to find if you actually look at your local government as well. Now, finally, I'll close this video with what I hope are suggestions on what we can do about it. However, what does government's public policy outcomes, what do they have to do with your ability to live a prosperous life or at least a life that, despite the inevitable setbacks you might personally have, that give you an opportunity to live your life to the best that it can be? Now, that is what I want to discuss today because I believe once more that people and kind of once more people understand how the seemingly boring public policy decisions made by bureaucrats and then politicians, of course, kind of at both a local and national level, these actually have just major impacts on your ability, our ability to live a successful and prosperous life. Now, these decisions and policies, which often appear to be crafted in kind of distant and disconnected political bubbles, far away from your day-to-day -day challenge of trying to just live your life, they may not feel so distant when they impact you and I and our ability to survive and then thrive at home. One of the most obvious and increasingly harmful impacts of poor governance and policy choices is the direct impact that inflation has on our ability to live. Inflation is essentially a monetary pheno uh, phenomenon, but which basically it typically just means that something which once cost maybe a dollar last year, for example, now it costs two dollars today, and you're probably going to cost you five dollars tomorrow. Now, nothing about that one dollar product that you originally were paying a dollar for has changed. It is simply more expensive, and then it's going to become even more expensive soon. And while it is likely that bureaucrats wish to pretend right now, you can see it all the time, that inflation's just not happening, that type of resistance to reality is just merely political posturing. The political finger pointing is already happening, but the essential value of the dollar that you and I have today is far less than it was last year or 10 years ago, and it's going to be worth even less tomorrow. That is uh, simplistically kind of a direct result of inflation. Now, this is most clearly reflected in the cost of few, uh, food and then fuel, rent, insurance, power, water, car repairs, and just the other basic necessities of life. And I'm sure everybody watching this video, you've experienced the sticker shock associated with these substantial cost increases just over the past couple years. Cost increases which really most people can't afford to pay, especially as they keep escalating. And these are cost increases which force people to change how they live, how they live their lives in both small and big ways pretty much every day. The clearest government public policy which causes inflation is radically increasing the supply of money into the economy, which means there's more dollars chasing fewer goods. But that isn't the only dumb public policy that inevitably hurts you and I. By the way, this is nothing new. Nations have done essentially the same thing for thousands of years with the same harmful, catastrophic results. We often arrogantly believe that this time it's going to be different, but it rarely is, and plenty of countries and nations have done the same dumb things before. Our current political class, they just want to pretend that it is different this time around. Politicians and the special interests who support them, they're always looking for kind of a bailout and they're willing to kick the can down the road so it is actually somebody else's problem in the future. And remember, bad public policy can appear to have no consequences for a time because there's always this kind of lag time for dumb public policy to actually impact our day-to-day -day lives. But the horrible public policy choices of last year, and of course the last decade or more, are impacting us right now, and inflation hurts us all. Anyone who wants to pretend that inflation doesn't hurt you is probably just a political hack who wants to conceal the truth. So printing massive quantities of cash and then dumping it into the economy is one way the government creates inflation and hurts you and I. 
Now, another way government's public policy choices hurt you is when government spends far more than it brings in to cover those government costs. I mean, this is what creates not just the actual deficit, but kind of grows over time to become the government debt. And of course, it gets worse with unfunded mandates for the future. This ensuring that basically at some point in time, there is going to be a very, very costly reckoning. Now, we don't have a tax collection problem in our country. We do have a spending problem, and we always spend more than we tax, no matter how much tax is collected. There just doesn't seem to be any practical way to repay this escalating debt right now. And as the value of our currency drops, the inflation spiral just hurts us even more. Now, this money isn't free as much as the ivory tower kind of talking heads and illiterate college professors might want to pretend. There is actually a cost, and just a hint here. You and I and all the regular people, we're the ones who are going to suffer the greatest consequences and pay the final price. The political class and kind of the bureaucrats, they're just playing a more advanced game of musical chairs, assuming that they're going to have a place to sit when the cash flow orchestra comes to an end, and then the rest of us are left standing with absolutely nothing left to sustain our lives. Now, that is at the national level of political corruption back in D.C., and the Federal Reserve, and of course, and the government games they play, which will most certainly make life miserable for us and future generations. But let's look closer to home where public policy choices are made, which also have similar impacts in our ability to live our lives. Now, it's usually taxes that that's typically the most obvious, the visible, and then, of course, probably the most reviled aspects of local government, which frustrate average working people who are just striving to get ahead in life. And it really doesn't matter if you're commuting to work every day trying to save enough to repair the leaky roof on your house or if you're living in a studio apartment in East Hill, Kent, trying to save enough to put a down payment on your first fixer-upper home. No sane person believes that government will spend their money better than they themselves can. And yet, this is the message our bureaucrats and politicians always present to us when they want to increase our taxes for whatever dream scheme that they cook up deep kind of in the bowels of government. They often say it is just the cost of coffee for a day, or only a few hundred dollars a month, or your taxes only go up 20 more cents per thousand dollar valuation, or it is only just a tiny increase in sales tax or fees. But of course, as we all know, it absolutely never stops. It just keeps escalating, and it's just going to never be enough. It is never enough because there is no greed greater than the insatiable greed of government. Whatever tax increase that they propose today, their plan is already to increase it further, like someone using just a one-way ratchet wrench to increase it tomorrow. It never goes down. It only goes up. And now these are only the obvious taxes, the taxes that they actually admit to imposing. And usually because of legal requirements, they're forced to admit that they're imposing them on us for our own good, of course. Another thing to remember about taxes is that there are hundreds of silos or entities that basically have the ability to impose or increase taxes and fees on you, and each, you and I, both, all of us really, and each silo only looks at the proposed tax burden from their very limited perspective. They never really consider the collective tax burden that they're imposing on regular people. And why is that? It's because they don't care about it. They only care about increasing their own little bureaucratic political empire. And rather than become more efficient or downsizing themselves, they will always look for a way to take more of your money and my money to make their lives and decisions easier. So if your local city council will decide that they need to give pay raises to their employees, they often won't say that out loud, but the government unions, of course, will increase their dues, and which will help cascade into a demand for higher wages, which the politicians or senior bureaucrats, they don't really want to fight. That's just too much drama. So they just approve a small sales or property tax increase. It's only equivalent to a $6 cup of coffee per day or a week or whatever, however they want to sell it. The local school district, they just push another levy because they need more staff, more programs, and another few administrators. But it is for the children, of course. Don't forget. And don't worry. It's only the equivalent of maybe $250 more a year on your property tax bill. The local public utility district, the local fire district, the county commissioners, etc. Basically, every day, every week, every year, the escalation continues in small steps, and it only is moving in one direction. Now, this is money transferred from you and I, kind of the lowly peasant citizen, to the bureaucrats and their basically administrative state schemes. And of course, the administrative state inevitably bloats even larger. 
Now, sure, they waste a lot of the money that they get. Uh, corruption, grant grifting operations, overpaid contracts, overpaid administrators, poorly managed funds, and I mean, why not? It isn't their money, and nobody's really looking over their shoulders, unfortunately. It is your money, and they get to spend it however they want. Very few people pay much attention, and very few are watching. It's even fewer that are watching, and there are even fewer consequences to those who actually waste these funds. Now, remember, my definition of government is a mountain of corruption concealed by an ocean of incompetence, and the incompetence defense is, of course, the natural state of existence in government. So sorry, we lost $600 million to a Nigerian fraud scheme from our unemployment security department. Nobody's ever held accountable. Oh, we can't find $24 million in our homeless drug addict promotion program? Yeah, so sorry. Maybe we'll do better next time. I guess taxpayers didn't give us enough money. And oh, we illegally gave a $10 million no-bid contract on TI work at the atrium facility on Pacific Avenue in Thurston County, and then we misused capital funds for this? Yeah, it's no big deal. So listen, the list of these schemes and scams and incompetence and essentially theft of your tax dollars, they're endless, and bureaucrats just laugh it off. I mean, it isn't their money. Now, then there are, of course, the policies which directly impact the cost of living for everyone that's beyond inflation or taxes. Governor Inslee's carbon tax scheme, which he pushed through the legislature a few years ago, and which is currently in the process of being repealed if we vote for it when it lands on the ballot soon, it was kind of dressed up in whatever lipstick the pig needed to convince the tamed and controlled media to accept that this pig is actually now very pretty indeed. Call it saving the climate, the world, the children, the butterflies, kind of a guarantee for your next job after you leave the governor's office or whatever. The expensive poll-tested marketing schemes are all just smoke screens for the fact that these hidden taxes are essentially imposed as cash transfer payments. In this example of Governor Inslee and AG Bob Ferguson's carbon tax scheme, they increase the cost of fuel for you and I, and maybe the cost to heat your home, collecting that cash from the utilities or the wholesale suppliers, and then concealing the true cost from the public, even at the point of legal threats from AG Bob Ferguson against the utilities if they dare to reveal the true cost increases to the public on their bills as a direct result of this greedy public policy. By making poor people pay more for their fuel and to heat their homes, our political classes basically extract billions of dollars from poor people, and the resulting slush fund gives them political influence with more grants and expensive, unaccountable contracts. Of course, with the billionaires who are not stupid, and these billionaires often fund their political campaigns, these same billionaires know they can make more money with less risk if they use public funds to prop up their green projects or other government-friendly grant-grifting schemes. And all this just increases the cost of living for regular people like you and I, and of course our neighbors. Now again, this is on top of inflation or taxes. Government today extracts cash in this manner through these hidden fees, business fees, or other equivalent tax extraction schemes on your health care, higher education, food, water, utilities of any kind, and a variety of other impacts that directly increases your cost of living. It's our cost of living. Government loves this approach because they can pretend that it isn't a tax, and the average person gets angry or directs their anger against the utility or the business or the farmer. They never really understand that these organizations are acting as the middleman for the policy cost increase. And of course, these groups, they have a desire to survive, which requires them to increase their costs to absorb the escalating costs of doing business or paying off the government policies in some other way. If we were to ever implement a truth in government public policy, something I'd support, we would actually require that all these extra no value or low value added costs as part of every bill in Washington state have to be reported. And I suspect people would be shocked just how much their cost of living has just been artificially inflated just to satiate the greed of government and the political insiders who inevitably feed off that same government. Now, we see this cost in the phony permit costs that are imposed on homeowners, for example, or people trying to build a home, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars in costs paid to the central planning departments in every city or county, red or blue. That is simply extracted, not to improve the quality of the home, not to make the home safer or better, but simply to make it cost more for the owner. So the bureaucrats can extract that cash to pay themselves and their friends, of course, Often these day-to-day -day costs are extracted outside the view of the politicians, and because only the impacted homeowner, or maybe that desperate property owner, it only directly make them pay the price, the average citizen just doesn't really care. 
but these costs are imposed on tens of thousands of people every day. And then this misallocation of resources, this impacts not just the people paying the direct price, but it increases the cost of living for all the rest of us as well. Now, have you ever noticed that the more government becomes involved in something, the greater the cost of having that service or good becomes? Just look at the escalating cost of higher education. Since 1980, even adjusted for inflation, the cost of higher education has escalated 180%, with more and more subsidies from government all the time, which only act kind of like fertilizer on weeds to increase the costs and the debt that results from going down this road to serfdom and ignorance. Look at the cost, for example, of almost all forms of medical services in America today. The more government programs and subsidies and rules are created, the greater the escalation in costs. Many hospitals have more people worried about billing than they do actually uh, providing you medical care at these facilities. Now, the lower quality of the services that are received, of course, and then this kind of trend, unfortunately, isn't getting better. Now, there's endless examples of this all around us, and the policies imposed by government today at both the national and the local level only make it worse. They sometimes assume that the people, I think, like you and I, are that we're stupid, and they always promise to give us a subsidy or kickback, of course, kind of to poor people. And I'm sorry, government takes $800 from your pocket with their dumb policy choice, and then, of course, they want to refund you $200 so you don't feel bad about it. They truly believe that you're stupid. That's why they do this. Now, the traditional media is going to cover for bad government policy, of course, but I'm really getting a sense out there that most people are not fooled by the bait-and-switch program, which we see so often all around us. Hey, we stole your money, your lunch money, but let me give you a quarterback to show that we really aren't that bad and we really care. And yet our government, of course, does this all the time. So rinse, wash, repeat. It has worked for them before, so they're just going to keep doing this until they're called out on it. Now, on top of these government policies, then, they also impose this elitist kind of -of out-of-touch, in-vogue concepts that are cooked up on a college campus somewhere that are designed to directly harm you and I and our neighbors and also increase our cost of living, really as a direct result of the community costs imposed by the harm that they inflict. Now, let's look at public safety just as one example. The crazy public policy bandwagons that have been endorsed over the past 10 years in Washington state and, of course, elsewhere in America to take violent predators out of the prison system and then dump them into society early so that they can kill and hurt more people as quickly as possible. This is just one example. The public policy choice to have no cash bail or catch and release policing, soft on criminal sentencing, and then downgrading crimes like shoplifting, car theft, and robbery – These are all creating another round of escalating cost increases on living for the rest of us. It isn't just the victims of crime who suffer, although they suffer the most. It is the costs imposed on their neighbors as they try to arm up, for example, or install cameras or window bars and alarms and tracking systems on their cars and other lifestyle changes, which aren't free, and they divert their money into now less productive results than what they would have spent that money on otherwise, all increasing the cost of living. The thing about the escalating crime wave in our state and elsewhere is that the rich people who live in Medina, for example, or Microsoft neighborhood in Issaquah, and who actually typically vote for the same politicians who impose these costly schemes on the rest of us, if these people have their catalytic converter stolen from their expensive car, it's just a funny post on Instagram for their friends to laugh about at their next wine and cheese club meeting at the Newcastle Golf Course. But if you're living in an entry-level apartment in Tukwila and this happens to you, you lose your catalytic converter, the cost to repair your vehicle may exceed your annual, annual savings that whole year. And it can actually really set your back your family's plans and dreams. And unfortunately, the political class who promote these harmful policies, they just don't care about the victims they create by coddling criminals and unleashing them on the poor and middle-class families. Our political class just doesn't care because it makes them feel good to kind of pander to violent criminals. Now, even A.G. Bob Ferguson's pet project that was promoting the release of violent sex predators secretly into our communities, this is just another example of this elitist thinking with no concern for the consequences. Notice, by the way, that they don't empty the McNeil Island violent sex predators into the homes located next door to Bill Gates or Governor Inslee's home on Bainbridge Island. Nope, (laughs) they don't do that. They just dump these guys quietly into rural neighborhoods, maybe in Kitsap County or Enumclaw, Canton, Tenino. And hey, it isn't going to be their kids who actually get molested and murdered, just yours, mine, and our neighbors. So the question in the end, of course, is what can we do about it? Now, first, we need to reach out and explain to everyone we know just how these harmful public policies, while popular with the insider political class and the grifters who profit from them, how these policies are definitely hurting the rest of us. 
directly hurting us. The more people understand this, the easier it is for them to recognize that some of these trends can and they must be reversed. These negative outcomes, not acts of God or Mother Nature, but they're acts of politicians, special interests, and bureaucrats, these can be reversed. It's harder to reverse inflation at the national level, but we most certainly can reverse some of the crazier and more damaging local public policies that hurt us in our communities and our state for really no good reason. Once people begin to recognize that these daily costs of living, increasing crime, subsidized drug addiction, increasing costs, kind of collapse in education, increasing power and fuel costs, once they realize that a large amount of this escalation can be slowed and even reversed, I think then we can begin to effectively organize to identify, recruit, and support people who are actually willing to get into these public offices and promote policies that reverse and eliminate the damaging programs. And of course, these grifting oper operations, kind of these other harmful policies that we have in place today. Now, part of this is going to, this is inevitable, really, it's going to be removing some of the laws and rules that exist right now. And part of this inevitably involves shrinking the size and bloat of government. We really don't need this just massive administrative state. And of course, the staff that exists primarily just to justify their own existence, not to do anything that helps us. In some cases, entire departments can be eliminated. Entire agencies can disappear tomorrow and the world will be a better place. In some cases, we can outsource key jobs more efficiently to private sector options. And many times we should remove the senior management in the first place, definitely remove them. In other situations, we can downsize in stages and kind of focus on the metrics and efficacy of the local government results. And listen, it requires an intense level of delusion and self-deception to believe that we can just maintain the current pace of the growth and the massive bloat of government. We just can't. Everyone who is honest must admit this fact. The question is, how do we deal with it? Do we let it catastrophically blow up someday and then let it collapse in some type of anarchical, Mad Max kind of sort of manner? And that may sound cool and fun to some, but that level of instability is unlikely to end well for most of us. It is harder to see how we can change the corruption and failures of D.C. today. But in our own backyards, we can make local politicians and uh, bureaucratic changes that I think can make it more likely that our communities and states kind of come out of the inevitable mess and come out of it in better shape than we might survive otherwise. And this is good and legitimate public policy goal. It really is for all of us. For those of us who care about liberty and freedom in particular, we owe it to ourselves, our family, future generations, and our community to work towards this outcome. And who knows, maybe with enough of us doing the right thing, as hard and challenging as it certainly will be, we can spread the examples and improving outcomes and reducing costs of living Still certainly higher than they should be, but trending in a better direction than it is now. Perhaps these types of positive outcomes can actually become examples for others to imitate, and good examples can actually spread to other places as well. It's not just bad ideas that spread. Regardless, I don't believe we have the option of playing neutral, looking away or just kind of pretending that this isn't happening. Those days have long passed us by. I certainly wish previous generations had addressed them more effectively in their time, rather than having us face this now, but here we are today. We're forced to deal with these issues now, whether we want to do it or not. We just don't have a choice any longer. It absolutely can get worse, of course, and it most certainly will without getting involved. But if you want to start the long and difficult road of fixing what has been broken, then you have to show up. We all have to show up. Because, as I always say, the future belongs to those who show up. 